he is holiness itself, beyond the power of thought to grasp or of word to express, beyond the power of all praise. He is an almighty God. He is not only the creator, he is the sustainer of everything that is. If God ceased to sustain this universe, it would collapse in a moment. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will, and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence, and sparks flew therefrom, and he caught them on the tips of his fingers, and flung them out into space, and bedecked the heavens with stars. Oh, you ready for it? Been waiting six months to say uh, good morning. <laughs> oh man, you know, for 26 weeks, it's been 26 weeks since we've met in this facility. It was August the 20th. We had a guest speaker here, had a guest speaker scheduled for the next week and we had to cancel because we didn't think it was safe flying him into Houston and uh, that was a good move. We looked really good on that. And we know this, although we've been out of, the, out of the church for half a year, you may say, does it feel like half a year to you? I said, no, seems like two. <laughs> seems a lot longer. We've been out of the church for half a year. Uh, we lost a building, but we kept saying we never lost a church. We kept meeting together, right? We served our family, our church family. We got into homes and into our community's homes. We prayed together, we, we sang together, we rallied together, we worshiped together, we still met in small groups, Next Gen didn't miss a beat, they kept going. We found out that wherever we were, that's where church was, because the church is in a building. We learned early on, I told staff from the very get-go, we're going to learn that we don't have to have a whole lot of stuff to have church. All this stuff is nice, and it's just a mean, it's a tool for us to be able to convey a God. But you don't have to have anything to have church, just people there with hearts that love God, ready to, ready to you know, serve and, and lift Him up. How many remember having church on Facebook? <laughs> Our first service. <laughs> then we went to Calvary Church, thanks to Pastor Nathan for opening his church for us to, to go there. We were nomads. <laughs> we, were, we were beggars. We even had church in the park. How many remember that? How many still has indigestion from the chili? <laughs> then when Pastor Sam and his wife Beverly opened up church on the rock for us, and we got to meet there. And now, yeah. And now we are here. <laughs> and we are, we are at our place. Welcome home. And uh, how, many, how many could believe with me? How many could just have enough faith to believe that the best is yet to come? Yeah. We get to celebrate the, the most important thing today, and that's why we get, to, we get to celebrate water baptism, which is a display that I have come. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and I have turned my heart towards Jesus and accepted him as my Savior. So we get, we get to celebrate the very reason that we're even here today. It's, you know, we're, we're glad to be back home, but it's more than uh, having a building. And how many of you guys know that it's a very, very important, or it's good, helpful to remember where you've come from and what you've gone through. Helps you stay humble. Don't ever forget where God's brought you from. Helps you stay joyful. Feel, feel with gratitude. I remember the first pic that I received on my phone when I was on the island of Lumberton. And they said, here's the church. And here's what I got to see. And you've seen it before. And it's... And my heart sunk couldn't get here, couldn't, you know, she couldn't get out of the, the city, and it's like, man, you're so helpless to do anything, and show the other pick, please. Yep. The next one. And I remember just thinking, I, I, I came here, it was the, I mean, I was en route on the long way to get to, to Beaumont when I got a text that they just opened up the bridge, and so I changed directions because it'd be quicker and I got here to the church, just me and two of my girls, and had a flashlight and had to walk through this. And, and just, you know, the noises in my heart was just like, ah, oh, heavy. I know it's a building. I know it's stuff, but still, it's our stuff. And there was a lot of memories here. 
was thinking, man, this hurts. I, was, I looked around the, the, you know, the amount of damage and thought, God, we got a building plan. We got, we're building back here. How are we going to do this? And I just said, you know, it's going to have to be you. In those situations, you don't get the credit, you know. It's really good to be in those situations because you can't say, we did it. As you know, you had to have God to do it. God used his people in, in various means to do it. But, you know, here we are. And I remember telling my wife, she said, how are we going to do it? And I said, it's just going to be, it, it'll be a miracle. It'll be a miracle. And welcome to a miracle. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, with that being said, you know, we celebrate being home. I love seeing you come in. Celebrate that. But what we really want to rally around is uh, the God. We're going to celebrate the God that has allowed us to come back home. We're going to celebrate the God that is faithful. And we're going to keep our hearts turned to the right places. And we're going to celebrate being together. But we, we don't want to celebrate and forget the reason why we can celebrate. That would, that would not be right. So the past five weeks, we've been talking about God. It's a series about God. And one thing that I've kept mentioning is that because God is so beyond us and so big, so much bigger than us, and the word we'll use is transcendent, so far beyond us, there will always be a gap in our minds in trying to comprehend or understand God. I mean, and that's a good thing, right? You wouldn't want to be able to totally grasp God because that would put God on our level. God is so beyond us, so we'll never always know. The Bible says His ways are higher than our ways. We understand why and how, and there's some things. There will always be a gap. There will always be some mystery. But God has revealed to us enough that it far outweighs what we'll never be able to understand about him. So through general revelation, his creation, through special revelation, through his word, and through the person of Jesus, he has given us, a, he has revealed himself to us so that it's not inconsequential what we don't know, but we don't have to have it. It's not like to believe in God is a, a step out into to a, a dark room. We step out in the light. It's, there, there's evidence. So if you ever find yourself, ever from this point on, wondering about God, wondering about, more specifically about his desire for you, you know, how he feels about you, there's a place, and we're going to talk about it. There's a place in the Bible I want you to go to. And it will... Uh, it will show you the clearest picture, maybe one of the clearest pictures in the Bible of who God is. And you'll be able to see God in high definition. I continually refer back to this story for myself. When my mind starts to wonder and I start to, you know, just have logic and rationale and all these things start, you know, just what about this, what about this? But also when I sit down with people and they think, they say, God doesn't want me back. Why would God want me home? And they go through a, a list of things that they've done, and they're terrible things. They'll say, here, you want a picture of God and how he feels about you right now? And here it is, and I would begin to tell them the story and remind them. And the reason why it's so important is Jesus tells the story. And if anybody knows God, if you could sit down with Jesus and say, hey, just tell me about the Father. Tell me about God. He's the best one to be able to give us the definition of who God is. And the story is told for the purpose of painting a picture of who God is. And Jesus doesn't sit here and he doesn't say, well, here's God. God's omniscient, even though he is, or like he's all-knowing, or he's all omnipresent, uh, omnipotent. He doesn't use all these big words like a list of adjectives to say, here's God. Because we hear that and sometimes still we just we seem distant from who God is. He uses a story. Like we use stories with our children. If we want to get a point across, we give them a story, a parable. We give an example instead of just a list of things because there's more emotion in it. There's, there's more that we can grasp onto. I never knew my grandfather on my dad's side. He died when my uh, father was 18 years old. So we would ask a few questions about him. What was he like? And my parents, they could say, well, he was nice. He was unselfish. He was a kind guy. He was a hard worker. But they didn't do that. What they did, they tell me a story. They said, well, your grandfather used to drive a trolley for the city of Beaumont back in the day when they had the streetcars. And people would get on the trolley, and they wouldn't have enough money to be able to ride the trolley. And he'd just look at them, and he'd say, go on, go on. Just that one story told me so much more about my grandfather than if they would have given me a list of adjectives about him. And so Jesus tells a story. And here's how the story begins. It's in Luke 
15. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but I hope you're not you're just so familiar that you can't pull something from this today. Luke 15, 1 through 3 says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So what does Jesus do? He tells them a story. He tells them a parable. Now here's what I want you to see. And here's what I, I just can't wait to do this. That's why I always wanted to touch the screen, right? So you're the first part <laughs> to do this. I saw people, other people do this. No, but I want, it, it's helpful. I want you to see something. Is it a touch screen? It's touch, but it ain't doing nothing. So, so can I draw on it? <laughs> so he says, now the tax collectors and the sinners... And then it says they were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes. So there's two groups of people here, two different types of people. You got tax collectors and sinners. That's grouped into one, one category, right? Some things never change. <laughs> and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. Now, so you have an irreligious crowd, tax collectors and sinners, and you have a religious crowd, Pharisees and the scribes. Two different types of people. And he says, so he told them this parable. Well, he didn't just tell them this parable. He launches into three stories. Do you remember? There was a lost coin, there was a lost sheep, and there was a lost son. And it's consecutive stories. It's like bam, bam, bam. Because Jesus wants to paint a picture of the heart of God where his heart is. Again, if anyone knows who God is, Jesus would be the one to paint this picture. Now, in all three of these stories, there's the same elements. There's something that's lost. There's something that was searched for. There was something that was found. And what was the very last element? Does anybody remember what they did after they found the idol? They threw a party. They threw a celebration. Because what was lost was now found. What was away from home is now at home. So it goes. There's a father who had two sons. Well, why is Jesus telling a story about a father with two sons? Because there's two types of people in his audience that he wants to connect with. He wants the religious crowd to have a son that represents him. He wants the irreligious crowd to have a son that represents. He says, and this son asked his father for his inheritance early. Everybody say bad. Yeah, hey, don't, yeah, look at your son. If, you're, if your children are in the room, look at him and say, don't try that. <laughs> do, do not do that. It was offensive. It's shocking. Because here's what he's doing. He's the youngest son. He's up to get one-third of the estate. The older son would have gotten two-thirds of the estate. He's just basically saying, give me one-third of all your belongings right now, everything you own. And when he gets the money, he heads off. He leaves town, which means he leaves the father. So more than just leaving town, he's, he's, leaving, he's leaving dad. He's got a lot of money in his pocket, and he's going, to, he's going for freedom. He's got freedom, what he thinks is freedom. No rules, no authority telling him what to do. We all know the story. He spends it, he probably has a great time. But he spends it and he, he ends up at the bottom. And then he realizes, I want to go back home. So what he realizes is that I have overestimated myself. I've overestimated my own depravity. I'm not as much in control as what I thought I was in control. So here's what he said. He comes up with this speech. He said, I will arise and I will go to my father and I'll say to him. It's like he's thinking this. He's he's prepping his speech right now and here's his speech father i've sinned against heaven and before you and we all have right and we all sin against god now is this a true statement for him did he sin against his father and against god yes or no yeah father i've sinned against heaven and before you i am no longer worthy to be called your son why do we feel that way why are we coming back to God? Why do we avoid church when we're not doing well? Why do we feel like God doesn't want us? Why do we feel like we, during worship, we can't, you know, enter into worship because of the week we just had? Why when we mess up, we just kind of want to hide, cover ourselves, get some fig leaves and cover up ourselves and kind of stay away from God. And he says, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. That's not true. He said, then treat me as one of your hired servants. It's very humbling to be at this place. And there's three things that he has to overcome at this moment. And that's, first of all, his own shame. His own guilt. 
The second thing he has to overcome is a judgmental brother back at home. That if he comes back home, his brother's going to say, look what you did. Look what you did to the father. You took one third of our estate and you blew it. I told you, I, I, I've told you you were going to do that. I, I always knew this was the type of person you were. But the third thing that he had to overcome is facing his own father. Now he has to look into the eyes of the person that he kind of stole from and wasted one third of the estate. But here's the deal. If his father will take him in his arms, if his father will say, I want you home, it doesn't matter what his brother says. It doesn't matter about his shame because his father, you know, that's, that's his blessing. And you know what the father does, right? So those that are being baptized, let's go ahead and be dismissed. If you'll exit into the lobby, Tammy will give you instructions. I'm so excited for you guys. We should have built an underground tunnel. They could have just gone right down, you know. Man, we're just going right on with the sermon. Look at verse 20. He's on his way back. You can imagine what he's feeling like on his way back. I and mean, what is going through his head? What, what, what's dad going to say? What's he going to do? What's my brother going to say? He's probably hungry. And here's what happens. He arose and he came to his father. Remember, please, listen up. Look here. Why is Jesus telling this story? To show the heart of God. That's why there's two sons and that's why there's a father. And Jesus, who knows God better than anybody else, is telling this story. He says he came to his father, which would be we come to God. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion. Now, why would he see him a long way off? <laughs> He's looking for him. You don't see things a long way off if you're not got your eyes set. So he said, God is looking for those that are away. He's, he's a long way off. He saw him. And what does he feel? He feels compassion. And what does the father do? He runs. He embraces him. He kisses him. And the son says to him, he goes through his prepared speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. And the father says, yes, you have. I'm no longer to be called your son. His father said, no, that's not true. I don't know who told you that. Where'd you get that? You're, all, you're my son. I want you here. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and let us celebrate. For this my son, this my daughter was dead and is alive again. And he will... He was lost, or once was lost, and now he's found. And they began to celebrate. Do you know who was the least excited to see the younger brother come home? Who? No, the fattened calf. Come on. It's right there. You gotta get your theology right. Why does Jesus tell the story? Why does Jesus tell the story? He wants to say, this is your God. This is your God. This is how God feels about you. This is how God feels about you. All this stuff's still hanging over your head. Thinking why God is pushing back and why all these bad things might be happening and God's causing you, you know, God's causing this to happen because, because of what, no, 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 no. God's angry at me. He's, he's stiff-arming me. No, with a story like this, how did we ever get the idea that God will not welcome us back or God doesn't want to welcome you back home? How in the world with a story like this told from the person of Jesus did we ever conclude that he doesn't want you back? Is it maybe because we're raised in a performance society and a culture where that's how we get, we got to do something, get our parents, that boys, we don't make the grade, we don't perform well, we can't make the team, maybe everything we do, we got to look a certain way to be accepted, we got to, you know, Make so many sales to, to rise the ladder. I don't know. Is it possibly that we are in such a performance culture? But when he was a long way off, who saw who? Who felt compassion? Who ran and embraced? Who hosted a celebration? Who ran away? Who ran towards? 
Maybe we give too much weight. Maybe, no, not maybe. Maybe we give too much weight to older brothers and our own shame. And not enough to what, you know, our father feels about us. And the thing here is the audience didn't even know at that time that the one that was telling the story was in the process of revealing God's heart at that moment. He left home. He went to a faraway country. He was about to burden the offenses, our offenses, so that we could be brought back to God. So, you know, we celebrate being in a building right now. But you could be in this building right now, and you can be home, what we're calling home, and still feel like you're not at home. You can be among a crowd of people and still feel like you're alone. And I wanted for our first Sunday to share a story with you about our God and to help paint a picture that will stay with you hopefully for the rest of your life. But for many of you, you may feel that you are away. You just want to come home. Not home here, but home to your father. And the story tells you that God's not looking to stiff arm you today. In fact, he, he was looking for you before you got up this morning. He's waiting to have a moment. And I would love for you to be able to say, what is it, February the 18th, I came back home. I'm going to pray. And I believe it's as simple as you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And we'll go on from that. But that's a good start. And as I pray, I, if you want to start, have a new start, if you want to come back home, I want to say, God, I've been away, but I'm coming back home today. Thank you for being faithful to me. I want to come back home. And let's go from there. I want you to bow your heads and pray with me. And if that's you, you know, you pray. You pray. You confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, God. You're a faithful God. Just not, you know, we don't just celebrate you because of the provisions and things that you've given us. No, we want you more than we want your things. God, you know, we can all remember those that have come home, walking home and feeling guilty and wondering what other people are going to think. But yet, at that time, sensing your embrace upon us and sensing that we have the affirmation of our God and that you've done everything that you could to, to show us that you, you love us, you love your world, you desire us, and that you want us to come back home. So we confess with our mouths. We've been away. We have sinned. We've sinned against heaven against earth. We've sinned against you, God. But we recognize that and we believe that you sent Jesus to, uh, to shoulder the offenses, to, to bear the weight so that we could receive the acceptance of our Father. So God, I pray, thank you so much. I thank you that you welcome us back right now and that many people will begin new life in you starting this moment and that you would continue to reveal yourself. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...